How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Hey, Cam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm cold. It's still cold here. Still cold. <laughs> well, it's funny still when cold. it's still cold, being that it's still the same day that we started the salon. <laughs> but yeah, I know. You, are you would think the, the room that I'm in would get a little bit warmer. Yes. And it has, but it's, I'm still cold. I always thought basements were supposed to stay even temperatured. No? Uh, since we're in the ground, no. Oh, okay. I saw it on. on. I have a Don't basement look to me. basement. All right. Well, I got an episode for us today. It's a little short. Okay, hit you me. ready? Hit, hit, me. hit you. Oh, I'd love to hit you more than you know sometimes, oh, my friend. It's Monday, April 14th, 2003, when co-workers of Maria Cruz become concerned. 35-year-old Maria was always a dependable, conscientious employee who would never just not show up for work. Perhaps she took the day off and they weren't aware of it. Because honestly, they couldn't think of any reason that she would not show up to work. However, they had to stop thinking that the following day when once again Maria failed to show up for work. A few of her employee friends decided to swing by her apartment to check on her. They arrived to her home where they are greeted by a stack of newspapers on her front door which would be unlike her because she would collect those unless she weren't there. Mm -hmm. They knock on the door and no one answers. Clearly, Maria is not home and has been gone for quite a bit longer than just a day or two. But they are totally unaware of where she could have went because if she was planning a trip, she would surely have told one of them. It's about time for a wellness checkup, I would think. Call the police and have them come check everything out. Thank you. One of her friends contacts her uncle, who lives nearby in Queens, and he immediately calls police to report her missing and file a go. missing persons report on Maria. After talking to Maria's family members, police enter Maria's midtown apartment to look for clues. But her home seems perfect, as she had left it. Nothing was out of place and nothing looked disturbed. With nothing to go on, they must wait and hope Maria shows up. But hours turn into days. Police determined the last time Maria was seen was two weeks prior when she had been attending church and had actually spoken to people. The thought on that day was after church, she was going to enjoy an afternoon of shopping and actually she would do a quick stop by her office. And that is available on video as her coming into the building and leaving. But it's here that they lose track of her. About five months later, police get a subpoena for Maria's email. And I wonder why did it take five months, but okay. And they learned that Maria had had an appointment with a doctor named Dean Fiello. Police need to talk to Dean, so they head to his office to speak with him. And they're met with what I guess could only be described as a bit of a shock. It seems Dean had decided to take a vacation and leave the country. Huh, that's convenient, I think. Mm-hmm. At this point, officers are thinking, well, maybe these two could be possible, fell in love and ran off together. But let's be honest, does that ever happen on True Crime Podcast? And if it did, it would be a different podcast. Am I right? No, no. Sadly. In order to find Maria, the police need to first find where Dean is. They need to find out about Dean. So they learn that Dean grew up in a middle class suburb of New Jersey. Dean was a handsome and popular kid in high school, and after college, he moved back home and started working in construction. And let me just say, he was pretty darn cute. He had that really dark black hair and just, he was just a handsome 
fella. I was going to say handsome kid, but handsome fella. The other thing police found out was that there was no way Dean could have run off with Maria because Dean had long known something that not everyone else knew yet. The police, I mean. And that was that Dean was gay and he was out and he was proud. Everyone that knew him knew he was gay. He was he was proud of himself. Right. So the idea that Maria possibly ran off with him is out the window. That couldn't have happened. As Dean was working in construction, a call for a remodel came in from a popular spa called The Beach. And this is located on Christopher Street. And if you know anything about Christopher Street, that's a nice little area in New York City. When Dean made the visit to the spa, he not only landed the job, Jen, but he landed the owner, too. Go but um bump. The blonde 30-year-old Michael Hart was a good match for the tall, dark, and handsome Dean, who was always known for his good looks. And he really was. They talked about that over and over. The couple was living the good life as they jetted around all the places the New York elite did, such as Fire Island and the Hamptons. Dean soon left construction to work at the spa alongside Michael. Dean's specialty would be laser hair removal, and he was doing extremely well in it, so much so that he bought a fancy house and continued to live the high life until, sadly, all that would come crashing down. Now, when this took place, obviously, this is just me making a note, the laser hair removal industry was just starting, you know, so this was something that, I mean, quite frankly, people with money did you know, the rest of us shaved with a razor. (laughs) But the fancy (laughs) people had the laser hair removal, right? He, Dean, was doing really well with his clients, and they were the upper echelon, if you will. In April of 1991, Michael received news that he had, in fact, contracted AIDS. Sadly, he would pass away just seven months later in October. It was quite fast. And again, this is 1995. So the, the medicine, the technology is not what it is today. Dean had spent the last seven years with Michael, and he is absolutely lost without the love of his life. However, Dean knows that Michael would want him to carry on and continue to live life with this mantra that Dean decided that he would try something new. In 1996, Dean meets with a dermatologist by the name of Lori Polis in the hopes that she would be willing to take a chance on him and let him come to work for her at her office. His charm, charms, charms. His charm and good looks got him in the door, but it was his kind and generous nature that kept him there. Dean started working for Dr. Polis, and it was a great match at first. Dean went to Dr. Polis and told her some distressing news one day. Dean, too, had contracted AIDS, and with his time left, he wanted to leave the business and go spend his remaining days with his mother, his dear, sweet mother. Well, obviously, the doctor can't. What can he say to that? The staff all really liked Dean, and they were heartbroken, but they knew he had to leave and enjoy his final days with his mother, but they would miss him. Miss him as if he almost left. Mm. (laughs) Just a few weeks later, there was an ad in the New York magazine advertising a grand opening of a brand new laser hair removal clinic called, and I love this, Skin Ovations. (laughs) Right. Skinovations. Skinovations on the Upper East Side, owned by certified laserist Dean Fiello. Oh, FYI. Wait a second. There is, there is no such thing as yeah. that. But also, he was supposed to be in Florida with his right. dear mom. Skinovations. Oh, right. Jesus. It's almost as bad as our true crime podcast. It really is. <laughs> couldn't, come up with, couldn't come up with anything else there, Dean. Now, you need to remember that this was uh, the start of what would now become more commonplace today, but it was fairly new and it's making its way into mainstream. And that's taking care of yourself, laser, yeah, it was really dermatology, yeah. of course, mm-hmm. for the better people. Dean was doing great and he's servicing the rich, high profile clients. It was only going to get better from here and it was about to. You see, his business is going swimmingly but he was still missing the love of his life. But that's about to change. Dean meets a man by the name of Greg, and the two of them hit it off. 
Soon, Dean asks Greg to move into that fancy little house that Dean owns, and Greg jumps at the chance. After all, this would be a great way to spend time with the one you love and get to know them even better, you know, when you live together. Sometimes, Jen, you get to know them a bit more than you'd like to, as in you start to become aware of all those little things you may have overlooked at the beginning of the dating relationship. Am I right? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. We've all been there. Greg started to wonder why Dean slept a lot. In fact, he slept all day and all night when he wasn't out and about. And uh, Greg started to wonder why, why would he stay up all night, sleep all day, if he has a job? I don't understand that. Well, of course, Greg starts thinking, is Dean cheating on me? What's going on? Is Dean doing drugs? He's at a loss because this is the love of his life. He thought he hit the jackpot with Dean. It's not very long, of course. You know, House of Cards, Jen, it all comes falling down. It's not too much after this that the answers would become glaringly obvious to not only Greg, but the doctor whom Dean worked for just two years prior. And if you remember, Dean said that he had been diagnosed with AIDS and needed to go spend his final days with his mother. Um, we're going to about to find out why he's sleeping all day and staying up all night or going out all night and sleeping all day or doing both. It seems that someone, we're not going to mention any names here, was filling a prescription a little too often. And this person was a patient of Dr. Polis. Now, that's the same doctor that Dean had worked for just a few years earlier. Mm -hmm. The drug that was being prescribed and or being filled up way too often was a highly addictive narcotic nasal spray named Staydol. The patient was none other than dun, 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 Dean Fiello, which is interesting because I didn't realize, I guess, I mean, of course, but a narcotic spray, spray, you know, like mm-hmm. a like nasal, nasal spray? spray. Yeah, that's interesting, I thought. I guess it, it seemed, would go into your bloodstream quicker that way, or your brain. Mm. I don't know how it works, sure. <laughs> It seems good old Dean had stolen her prescription pad and had been writing the prescription to himself, which, you know, was frowned upon just a tiny very, little bit, especially much, yes. for narcotics. Dean it's is theft. A, yes, it is. Dean is arrested and charged with forgery and is sentenced to three years probation and mandatory mm-hmm. drug rehab. OK, you know, we no judge, no judge. We all, you know, people have problems in a drug First time offense, I'm sure, you know. When Dean returned from rehab, he was clean and sober, but he desperately needed money. During his absence, his clinic suffered, you know, skin ovations, was skinned, if you will. Dean needed money and fast, but he needed a way to make some quick cash and dun da da he had an idea. That laser that he had been using to remove people's unsightly hair worked so well that, hey, he thought, I'll start using it to remove other things. Like moles that were sometimes cancerous, moles that were never sent to a lab for diagnosis, moles that people were scared may be cancerous, came to him to have removed and biopsied. Yeah, that's not a good idea. The only thing is, Jen, Dean is not a doctor or, in fact, doesn't even have a lab or any way to get into a lab to have that diagnosed. These moles were never tested or any other skin ailments for that matter. The clients were simply told, nope, all clear, no cancer, you're good. And might I just say, because I I would love to know if any of those people, those poor unfortunate souls actually had cancer and didn't know it. Yeah. This never went to that. That's so, so, uh, Lord, I don't understand how people work. I don't. What? Wouldn't you feel guilty? Mm. I feel so guilty about everything. I should have been a Jewish Catholic. I feel especially, guilty about everything. Especially when people's health are, is at stake. But don't you? I mean, like when you I lay mean, down at night and it's darkness and it's just you and your thoughts, when you think, oh, it's probably not a good oh, idea. Oh, I couldn't do it. I, mm. In 2002, fed up with Dean and his dangerous methods of treating his clients, Dr. Polis reached out to the media asking them to investigate. And that's sort of like the contact to or I'm trying to think of all those good, you know, they they look into it. Here is where investigative journalist Barbara Nevins-Taylor steps in. She's going to go to the clinic 
she's going to keep a camera undercover. In fact, I think it was in her purse and see what she could find out. Under the guise of having a mole removed, she questions his education. And in fact, she asks, are you a doctor? And you can see Dean in the newscast, which I'll try to put that on the blog, but you know how that goes. He got him, yeah, yeah, huh. That's what he says, right? Like, because he's trying to avoid the fact that he is not a doctor. Again, she explicitly asked, since you're a doctor, I can trust you, right? And Dean says, well, you can trust me. So huh. he is giving the idea that he is a right. doctor, has a degree in medicine, and we all know that's a big uh, no, no, you can't do that. So this is going to air about a week later. It hits the air. And again, Dean Fiello is charged with practicing medicine without a license. A few days later, Dean turns himself into the police. And at this point, Dean's looking at four years prison time. You know, this is his second offense. They didn't have anything to do with each other, but still, it's, it's pretty bad. Dean, not knowing what to do, he uh, strikes a plea deal. We know how that goes with mm-hmm. authorities. His sentence would be reduced to six months, but only if he would do two things. Number one, help authorities find and charge other people who are practicing fraudulently, like Dean himself. So he would have to do a little investigative work and tell on them, basically. And two, he would shut his clinic down and never again practice laser removal. Oh, no. Skinovations will die? Skinovations has been skinned. It's gone. Skin ovations need a skin redo. Buffalo <sighs> Bill. He complies. But guess what? That only makes things worse. The finances are out of control. Good thing Dean has Greg. Greg's there to help him. Greg loves Dean. Greg's going to do anything for Dean. Mm-hmm. We all know how that's going to end, right? Mm-hmm. Greg pays for bail and all the attorney fees, and he's glad to do it since this is, in fact, the love of his life. However, Dean is at home sleeping his days and nights away. Greg is wondering, once again, what's going on? Then Greg opens the mail and is shocked to see just how bad Dean's finances are. Now, you have to remember, he was running that clinic, and all that medical equipment has to be bought Mm -hmm. or rented. Rented. Still needs to be paid off. Just doesn't go away because you had to go in the pokey for doing this illegally. Dean has not paid any bills, including the mortgage, for (sighs) weeks. Weeks. The couple has to sell their house. And, you know, the idea is to try to to recoup some of the money that they've lost. The realtor comes by. They hire her to come by and and take a look around, see what needs. They got to get rid of this house fast, right? So they call a realtor, Mm -hmm. come in, make a list of all the things that need to be done to the house, such as cement repairs in the driveway drywall patches, anything that needs to be done, new carpet, new paint, all that stuff that happens when you have to sell a house. The couple's good friend, Mark, bought a house nearby. And well, he was really good at doing small repairs. So they're friends, all that good stuff. He offers to come and help Greg and Dean out. He does. He's a good friend. It's better than you and I because whatever, but we're going to get to that. With the house ready to sell, it doesn't stay too long on the market. With the bit of money, Greg tallies up what Dean owes him, and that's the attorney fees, the bail, all the stuff that he's helped him with, and it comes to just under $100,000 that Greg has spent of his own money to help Dean. Now, Dean should pay him back for all these things Greg did for him. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But of course, Dean's not having any of that. He refused to pay Greg back one red cent. And with that, Greg was out of there, and he moved back to New York City. Good job, Greg. Honestly. That's a lot of money to lend somebody. Seriously. Well, the house was, it's old, it's really pretty, big. Mm-hmm. They would have lavish parties, of course, because, you know, they're, it's cool and it's fun and they're young-ish. I'm sure it was like the place to be, but it was also an old house, so it, it needed a lot of work just to get it up ready to go. Mm-hmm. But still. Not to mention the attorney fees, the bail, the lawyers, mm-hmm. the court cost, et cetera, et cetera. And to even stick by him through all of that? hmm At this point, Dean was homeless. He had nowhere to go. Doesn't have a place to work. He's not in a good situation. But thank goodness their good friend Mark, the one that came over and helped them fix up the place to get it ready to sell, stepped up and said, you know what? I'll let you stay with me. I know you need a place to stay. We've all been down on our luck every once in a while. So 
come on, you, you can stay with me. So Mark, of course, is just trying to be the good friend. And let's just say it was rough from the start. But when Mark stumbled upon Dean's drugs, that was it for Mark. He's at Dean, you got to go. He kicked Dean out. Dean was really never getting off these drugs. He might have slowed down. He might have had some sober time, sober periods. But he was, we know how bad from right. other episodes that we've done, how bad opiates and narcotics are. Not easy to kick, especially if you don't have any help. Yes, correct. So Dean's gone. And once he was gone, Mark began throwing things out that Dean had left behind into the trash because, you know, (laughs) that's what you do, I guess. One of the items was a piece of luggage that Mark had found in the, I guess, garage area. And he went and he opened it up and just wanted to see what was inside before he chucked it into the dumpster. And when he did, he discovered a purse, a girl's purse, like a lady's purse. So at this point, Mark is now thinking, great, great. Thank goodness I kicked Dean out because you know what? I bet you he was stealing people's credit cards and things like that to buy Mm -hmm. drugs. I mean, after all, what else could it be? Mark finds a wallet inside and the wallet has an ID in it with the name of Maria Cruz. He also finds an address book and figures, you know, I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to try to get this purse back to the woman that lost it or maybe that Dean stole from her. He calls the first person in the book. And when the person says that they do not know anyone named Maria Cruz, Mark begins to wonder just what the heck Dean was involved in, and he decides to chuck it all in the trash without calling anyone else or informing police. this point, I do have to say, I think if I found a purse, like if you came and lived with me for a while and I found a purse, I don't think I'd automatically jump to I would call the police. Yeah, I I don't think I would either. He had a drug problem. He could have stolen it, you know, out of somebody's car or whatever. It just, you know, what people do for drugs and things like that. I don't, it wouldn't jump to the worst possible thing. No, I wouldn't either. With no money and little to no friends left, because he keeps messing that up, Dean had no choice but to move into a local motel, and this is not the fancy kind either. It's pretty run down. So Dean has now went from high-profile Lazarus to the rich to a seedy motel. No tell motel. Mm -hmm. It's now October 8th, 2003, and Dean is due in court for the charges of impersonating a doctor. He's a no-show. Hmm. Okay. The case is rescheduled. And again, Dean fails to appear. A warrant is then issued for the arrest of Dean Fiello. Once again, Dean's ex, Greg, is left high and dry, as Greg was actually the one that posted the bail for Dean, ensuring that he would, in fact, show up for court. So Greg's furious, and he sets out to find Dean and get that money back, which bravo to him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, I'm not going to sit here and wait on this. Yeah, so he wants to find getting the money back. Thank you. He wants to find Dean, and he wants to sue him to get all that money back. But the problem is, Greg can't find Dean. And matter of fact, nobody else can either. A detective is assigned to the case. His name is Brian Ford. Detective Ford is going to try to find Dean for Greg. There's no red flags going off that anything, all the stuff is related, or so we think. Greg is under the impression that Detective Ford is helping Greg find Dean Fiello to get that money back. But there's actually another reason Detective Ford was interested in finding Dean, and that was to question him about a missing person named Maria Cruz. You see, when the NYPD found out that Detective Ford was looking into Dean, a detective called Ford and told him that they were looking for Dean, too. Seems that when Maria went missing, There were some emails on her computer from a Dean Fiello, and they wanted to have a little bit of a chat with them. And I guess these emails were a confirmation about her appointment with him that afternoon on Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. At first, the name Maria Cruz meant nothing to Greg. Greg had never met a Maria Cruz, and Dean never spoke of a woman by that name either. As if a light bulb went off above Greg's head, his eyes widened, and he remembered something very strange. 
He tells Detective Ford that the day before the house closed, the house that they had to sell very fast to get money, Dean was adamant that he had to do one last project on the house. It was a project that the realtor never mentioned needing to be completed. It was a project involving a building in the rear of the house and a lot of concrete. Greg even remarked that he thought it was weird, especially since they were handing over the key to the new owners the very next day. Greg then asked Detective Ford, when did Maria Cruz disappear? Detective Ford said it was in April. And when did you sell the house? They both knew the answer. The timing Mm -hmm. fit perfectly. Damn it, Dean. Drugs are bad. People don't do them. It's now February 2004 when Detective T.J. Maroney decides to take a little drive to Dean's former house. The current owners, and could you imagine this? The current owners agreed to let the detective take a look around. Inside the carriage house, it was apparent that some recent concrete work had been poured in the form of a slab, sort of like, you know, a little, I don't know, four by six inch Mm -hmm. slab. Mm -hmm. Enough for a body. Mm Mm-hmm. A week later, officers return to the carriage house, but this time they have some heavy-duty tools, such as a jackhammer. They begin to work on the area and break up the concrete. They see it. It's a suitcase. They pull out the suitcase, open it, and inside is a body. Now, honestly, could you imagine if you bought this house and all of a sudden these police officers knock on the door and they say, hey, can we go look in your garage, carriage house? And then a week later, (laughs) hey, we're here with the jackhammer. We're going to we think there could be a dead person. I, I, mm-hmm. okay, I'm selling it. See you. Bye bye. <laughs> I'm out. Uh, so let me just say real quick the um, police officer interview said that you could smell it like right when they took uh, off the concrete. Like they knew it. They knew yeah. that something was already there because that smell had been encased in that concrete for, you know, whatever. So the medical examiner is able to identify the body by the serial numbers on her breast implants. It mm-hmm. is the body of Maria Cruz. A missing person's case has now become a murder, and a missing person is now a wanted man. Police now can theorize or put together what they think happened. They believed on that Sunday Maria disappeared. She had scheduled an appointment with Dean to take care of a little issue she had. Now, this issue was black tongue. Do you know what that is? Uh, Isn't it when your hair get like a hairy tongue it looks like that yes but yeah. it's it's basically i guess kind of like thrush mouth it's an overabundance of if you're out on antibiotics for an extended amount of time it like throws off everything your pH However, balance yes the major thing here is it's totally curable goes away on its own does not need to be treated even though it's unsightly especially with lasers right thank you <sighs> on a tongue seriously i know hello So nice little Maria went to go have that taken care of. And I'm sure it was unsightly. She was embarrassed. I Mm -hmm. understand. Dean, in the meantime, had talked a friend into letting him use his apartment to do such treatments. Because remember, (laughs) he's not supposed to have anything to do with this line of work ever again. Not to mention renting out a place. He has no money. The idea, talk about your shady back-end deals on a Sunday afternoon, evening, really. The friend had agreed to let Dean use the apartment for this kind of thing. Maria, Did she really think that was hair, though? No, I think she was just embarrassed. No, she knew it was black tongue. It looks like it's hairy, but you don't call it that, I don't think. Maybe you do. No, I know, but I'm just saying, why would you even call him to get it done? Because he was... That's just what I was curious about. It's sometimes how the stars just fall in line. You know, why would you... I'm sure it was a cheaper deal because he needed the money for drugs. She was very well-to-do. In fact, I think she worked on Wall Street. She was sort of a banker. I don't want to say economist, but she had a really nice apartment, especially for New York City. Single woman, like nice. I'm guessing she wanted to save some money, but the point is, is she made plenty of money, and I sure wouldn't skip on something like that, but that's just me. Maria went to her appointment that afternoon at around 3 p.m. with 400 bucks cash to pay for the treatment. Now, once in the chair, Dean injected her tongue with lidocaine to numb it. Now, it's here that authorities think that either Maria was allergic to the drug or, this is what I'm guessing, because at her age, her mid-30s, Dean gave her way too much, Mm -hmm. and it caused Maria to go into anaphylactic shock. Instead of calling 911 or even taking her to the hospital, which, 
A major hospital was located just two blocks away. Like he could have carried her there. She was a little tiny thing. Didn't want to get in trouble. Dean chose to do nothing except save himself, but not revealing what he had been illegally doing and what he had promised never to do again via his plea agreement. Selfish Mm -hmm. bastard. Really is. It was just a week after they recovered Maria's body that authorities were able to locate Dean Fiello. Dean wasn't hiding out. In fact, he was lying out, as in the sun at the beach on the sands of a luxury resort in Costa Rica, (laughs) literally drinking Mai Tais. Not kidding. Dean is arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He fights for eight long months to avoid extradition, but finally returns to New York City. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice guy. Yeah, I hate him. In October 2006, Dean pled guilty to first-degree assault and receives a sentence of 20 years and is currently serving his time at Attica in New York City. You ready? Good. Dean Fiello is going to have a parole hearing in March of next year, and if he gets parole, he will be out by July 2022. So a year and a half, a little bit less, he will be out. Bet you he gets paroled. I bet you he does, too. Dean, who has now said that he is HIV positive, has been busy writing for various magazines and blogs, including prisonlectionary.net. And let me just say, again, rabbit hole, I go in there and read all this stuff because it just interests me. So this uh, blog states that, thank you for Uh visiting Prison Lectionary. Prison Lectionary is a virtual space devoted to biblical interpretation by artists and authors incarcerated in jails or prisons in the United States. We provide a forum for the voices of prisoners who are the most authoritative witness to incarceration. And we serve as a repository of information for the study of the revised common lectionary text and other scriptures. And this right here is from the words of Dean. I write early in the morning before the noise and chaos of prison began, inspired by the bleating of seagulls and a strong cup of coffee. During my nine years at Attica, I've embraced changes in my thinking. My attitudes, beliefs, goals, and hopes have evolved. Education has been a large part of my transformation. I hope that the learning process never ends. And he writes for various LGBTQ plus things, uh-huh. as well as prison stories and things like that. Like he's written, he's not altogether a bad writer. He's not a nice person, but he's not a bad writer. So that is the case. So I'm assuming he's gotten help for his drug addiction while he's in prison. I don't know. From what I've heard, you get more drugs on the inside than you do the out. But I know. I, I don't know. Stay tuned and we'll see. Like I said, uh, it'll be a year. He'll get that parole hearing. And I'm kind of with you. I bet you he is paroled just because this was such a kind of a particular crime. If he stayed clean, he probably wouldn't harm again. But talk about your narcissist. Let me tell you. Woo. No doubt. And I'm glad to see he's not doing electrolysis in prison. You never know, Jen. He might be. You don't know. He could be. They, They do tattoos with tattoo guns. So they do. They do. Wow. Yep. That's the story of Dean Fiala. Interesting. Fiala. Very, Fiala. very interesting. Yep. I just felt sorry for, like, Greg, because you meet this guy and you think, oh, what a nice guy. And he's got a good job. He's handsome. We're going to move in together. It's going to be great. And then you move in with him and he won't get out of bed. Well, you know something's up, right? There is probably red flags. You just don't want to see them. That's the problem. You just don't want to see those red you flags. You never do. Plus, it's forgot to write down how many he was getting a month, but pretty much sniffing all day long. Let's put it that way. It was a done, not just like two or three, but all day long. But of course, that's what happens when you're on a narcotic. You do build tolerance and you want that buzz. So you keep going, keep going. And you need more Mm -hmm. and you need more and you need more. I'm surprised it didn't go into other things like uh, heroin or. And he might have. I mean, I'm not sure about that, but it's just he he had the dermatologist drug pad. So he went with Stadol, which I guess is a pretty strong narcotic that you inhale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Wow. Very interesting. So drugs are Good bad. Job. Don't do them. He could have had a pretty successful career in that field at that time. He could have, but the minute he started taking moles off, mm-hmm. there's a big difference between doing medical procedures, even those as small as removing moles 
to like taking hair mm. off. Mm. Laser. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Guess money does weird things to people. And I think it, I'm guessing she was just horrified and embarrassed because it is an unsightly little thing. But I would just keep my mouth shut, I guess. Well, but- yeah, but the last thing, I mean, you'd go to the doctor to get diagnosed and he'd say, well, you know what? It'll go away on its own. You don't immediately call your friend the laser hair removal and say, hey, can you take this mm-hmm. off my tongue? And he says, no problem. There's a huge jump to that. And it's a laser with soft tissue. Exactly. Hmm. You've been watching anything good on TV? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. And that's Speaking everything of, okay. that I said. I, I do have one. I don't think I've said this yet. Mm-hmm. Because whatever. Jen, as you know, I have a problem with television, and that's all I do, really. And I play it if I'm doing something, whatever. So I stumbled upon Fear Thy Neighbor. And I was like, this is going to be lame. Five seasons later, holy <laughs> moly. There are some people out there that I had a bad neighbor in California. Her name, uh, we're not going to say her name, but it rhymes with Claire. And she was black and she hated black people. That's why she ran into me because I was white. She told me that. That's your first clue. Number two, couldn't have the windows open. She'd scream at you through the windows. Went through our trash. My sister was staying with me on asleep on the couch. I remember you complaining about yeah, her. She, mm-hmm. she came in our house when nobody was home and didn't know my sister was there. She was a terrible person. Terrible. And she was a neighbor. She had no right to do any of that. However, this whole show, there's some people I, I just, I can't. And there's people that really have mental instability. That's one thing. But there's other people that just get so angry they can't. For instance, there was a, a man and uh, it was on a lake and he was an older guy and had lived there forever. And then this family moved in. They had like five little kids. And, you know, kids run around, they do what they do. But there was a dock, Mm -hmm. and the dock had always been more so on the older man's land, but it was the only place that you could put a dock. Well, they got into it, and he gets mad at the younger guy with the family, and he actually goes and he kills every single one of them, goes into their house and kills them. One lived over the dock. Mm. Well, did you see the video of the three people in Pennsylvania? Yes, the Where they snow start shoveling. Fighting? Yep. That, that's yes. the whole, that's how I stumbled upon, we were talking about it at school. And this is, I was like, well, you wouldn't believe this. And it's just, this guy had dogs and they were sweet dogs. Mm-hmm. They were nice dogs. And the lady that lived next to him, I told you the story because we were talking. She loved animals. She loved cats and she tried to save them. So she had so many cats that she actually had some money and she bought a neighboring house just to keep her cats in, right? So the cats had their Mm -hmm. own house. Well, she kind of got in a fight with the neighbor because of all kinds of things. So he went and got rid of his nice dogs, and he got two mean dogs. Mean, like mean. Anyway, she would get up every morning before work, so she'd get up at like 4.30 and go feed those cats at the other house. So it's still dark out. One morning when she was getting up, he purposely let the dogs go, and they mauled her to death right there. Oh, Jesus. And this is like fights over nothing. It was fights over the fence. Like, literally, a fence. Mm-hmm. People are crazy. They really are. And it's really scary nowadays. You can't... I'm mouthy, and my husband's always scared to death that I'm going to end up being killed because I was mouthing off to somebody. Not you. No. I know. I don't. I just kind of... I, I try not to because people, they scare me. You just never know. Well, I try not to now, but especially now because, you know, everybody's locked up because of... They're What's mm-hmm. going on in the world mm-hmm. and people are losing their marbles, absolute mm-hmm. minds. Mm-hmm. So I've been trying to hold my tongue as much as possible, but it's hard. I just keep thinking I can't take people right now. I can't acknowledge their stupidity. I just can't. And all it does is upset mm-hmm. me. So I don't. That's why I do not get on Twitter anymore. I hardly get on Facebook. I'll go to Instagram to check our podcast. That's it. I just can't. I can't. Yeah, I can't deal. I haven't been on a lot of it. The either. haters, you know. Mm-hmm. Choose taters over haters. Yep, exactly. Yep. No, I haven't. I've been kind of shying away from social media, too, for the same reason. I just can't take the negativity or mm-hmm. just how asinine mm-hmm. people have and been just, lately. Just hateful. Hateful. That's what I always think about, hateful. saying things. And wanting to fight. Yes. And, and just what? You can't say anything mm-hmm. without people jumping down your throat nope. and taking things the wrong way. Nope. And yeah, it's horrible. For instance, let me just, we'll end on this. And I, only because I was shocked. Okay, so somebody that I'm Facebook friends with posted something. 
And I was like, oh, this is going to be terrible. So I got out the popcorn, right? And I'm going to sit there and read through the comments. Somebody, I have to keep this pretty neutral, but somebody comments on that post. And the post was a joke. I get it. Albeit, it was definitely could be offensive. Let's put it that way. But I knew it was a joke, but still. So somebody chimed in and said, I, I, why do you always comment? Because the person had commented, I, why do you always say things like this? I feel sorry for you. And then the, it goes back and forth. So then all of a sudden, this random guy goes, Mr. Ed called and wants his teeth back. So then I'm like, what's that mean? So then, of course, I'm like, okay, that's a slam at somebody's face. So I had to go check Uh out the person. And then I was like, oh, she did have a large mouth. That's fine, though. That's fine. But then it went into plastic surgery and that you have fake, fake everything. And I was like, wow, wow. Yeah, once you start insulting people's looks, the fight's over. Well, I was just like, that's not even a fight. It's just uh, petty shit. And I bet you they don't even know each other. That was just a total comment on looks. And I was just like, oh, I can't take people. I can't take people. Mm All right, that's all I got. No. Well, to end on a funny note, you know, it's been really cold here. I don't know if we've said oh, that Oh, my skin enough. is so dry mm-hmm. and itchy. It's terrible. Yep. Same here. That's what I was going to talk about. It's just awful. And, you know, I have psoriasis, so I always lubed up. I always have a ton of and not the cream good and everything. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was talking to my daughter and I'm like, it is so dry out there that I'm going to have to get your dad to put lotion on my back because it's just it itches and it's so dry. And she goes, oh, I know a way to take care of this. This is what I do, Mom. Uh Uh-oh. She's 12, by the way. She goes, what I do is I put lotion on my wall, (laughs) and then I rub up against it. No, she does not. And I'm like, oh, honey, no. Oh, did you not Don't do that anymore. But then also, oh. Oh, I did, but I just keep She's like a little animal. I kind of want to sell the house. I know. We want to sell the house, and we're probably going to have a huge spot. Yeah, you'll have to keel it, like... No, no telling it. Well, yeah, I, am, I'm I like, admire oh, her for no. her ingenuity. That's pretty good. <laughs> Very inventive. Yes. Great way to problem solve there. But, but I love um, that she told it yeah. to you with such an honest heart that you thought, and she, this is a great idea. Thank you. This is a great idea. I've solved the world <laughs> of I love her. needing a second person oh, to put lotion on their back. Why didn't I, I think know. of that? Dang. I'm like, sweetie, that's great, but next time let me put it's not on do you. that, isn't it? Yeah. It's not good for the oh house. Oh my god, I love yeah. her. That's amazing. Guess what? So, on that note, try to stay warm out there, especially if you're in the Midwest and exactly. North or whatever. And take care. And take care of yourself. Bring those fur babies in. I'm just all upset about birds. I was because like I don't know. Are they even okay out there in squirrels? Like those kind of animals, rabbits. Sure they do are. they make it okay? I don't know. They're in their burrows. Not to mention they're little fine. doggos and kitty cats. I'm sure they're called. Yeah. the How cold it is right now, the animals don't have Mm-mm. a chance. I, I don't even think they make in. it 15 minutes. You're cold, they're cold. Seriously. Bring them in. All right. Mm-hmm. On that note, Jen, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Oh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Bertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Hold on a second. I made it bigger, so I hashtag blind. That's what she said. Dar, 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 dar. Okay, now it won't even go. Seriously, people? Okay, here we go. You know what I should do? Does that work better? Hold on. Sometimes when I do these stories... 
I read them in what I think would be a good reporter voice in my head. Do you know what I'm saying? I bet you do that too, don't you? Mm-hmm. Poor Nico has to listen and put up with all this shit. Sorry, Nico. Ready? He had been not transcribed. What do you call it? Not prescribed. He had been diagnosed. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for <laughs> totally thanks for working that out for me. I had to think it out. None of those words that you were saying actually meant what you meant. So I know, but I got there, didn't I? This, this is what come to my mind. Here we go. Let's start again. A missing person's case has now become a murder, and a missing person is now a wanted man. Sometimes I like my writing. Like, I, I was going to say was that pretty... was a very nice license. Thank you. Lesson. Little Did little segue job. there. Thank you. Pride myself sometimes. Other times, not so much. 